In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Christ is risen. Today's Gospel reading is full of meaning and full of background stories that um, just make it such an extraordinary reading for us today. So the man is born blind, as we just heard. Uh, No one in the history of the world has ever been cured from blindness from birth. So even in the writings of the Old Testament, when people were healed, even some of the raisings from the dead, no one had ever in the history of the biblical uh, tradition that we have and everything that we know in the Old Testament and the New Testament, no one had ever been cured from blindness from birth. So this man is cured by Christ, but as before he's cured by Christ, the disciples see this man. So Christ is walking with his disciples. The man is kind of sitting there blind. He has really, as some of the fathers of the church say, didn't, didn't have any eyes at all. And as he's sitting there, the disciples look and they say, who sinned, this man or his parents? Which is now another side of things. Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Why would the disciples say that? Well, the disciples said that because in the book of Deuteronomy, in the fifth chapter, verse 9, it speaks about God saying that those who hate God, the parents who hate God, that I will take out my vengeance on them for the next generation and the generation after that and the next generation after that. So in other words, if, if you have bad parents, you're probably going to be bad kids. And it might sound kind of eh, pocket hold or, or prejudiced, but that's the, what the Bible says is that those who hate God, that his blessings will be missing from the parents if they too, or from the children, if they too uh, continue in that same vein. They will be devoid of the blessings of God. And they will suffer. So we see that the disciples say, why is this man suffering? Did he sin? Did he start it? Or was it his parents who did it? So that's going back to the Old Testament, uh, understanding that sin uh, ultimately from the Adam and Eve, sin ultimately leads to death. And if you look at the Old Testament, go back to the book of Genesis, when we hear about uh, creation, we always think that, you know, Adam and Eve sinned and, and then we die, and then something that happened. But all of creation was broken. In fact, even the animals that we see in the creation did not eat each other like they do now. In fact, I was watching a, a National Geographic the other day and it was uh, the world's deadliest animals. And it, it's really a show. Have you ever seen that? It's kind of like going to the butcher shop and watching um, uh, you know, the butcher just hack away at animals, except the animals are the butchers. And they're, they're just eating each other up. And that didn't happen prior to the um, fall of humanity. In fact, global warming and all the problems that we have today Uh, whether or not you believe that's a politically driven thing or if it's a reality, whatever, all the problems in creation, tornadoes, hurricanes, all these things are all a a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. In fact, that sin ultimately leads to death, our death. So we look at the, the, uh, the creation and we see that there is this brokenness. And the brokenness, in order to get to death, in this this fallen creation you have to also be sick most of the time right unless you get run over by a bus or something typically people are sick and then they die so this man who was blind has this disease if you want to call it that whatever it could have been a vitamin deficiency it could have been a birth defect whatever it was he had something that was a direct result of the fall of mankind but also the disciples also felt that Not everybody has those diseases right away, so what did he do? And Christ says it wasn't him, it wasn't his parents, but it's so the glory of God could be made manifest. In other words, this man who has been born blind, probably with no eyes, now will see in a way and be able to be the one in the whole context of the Bible. So that big intimidating book that everybody has at home, the over, you know, 1,500 pages of the Bible, that this man, the blind man, is the only one in the history of the world to that point that would be able to see from, 
being blind from birth. And Christ says that. It's, he's blind so that the glory of God could be made manifest, so that this miracle could be shown to all the world. Then the man is cured. He is, he, Christ puts clay on his hands and says, go wash. Now, why didn't Christ, is a kind of a question you might be asking, why didn't Christ just say to him, receive your sight, right? He sees the man on the pallet and says, pick up your pallet, go home, walk, get up. And the man picks it up and goes, why does he take clay and he spits in the clay and puts it on his eyes and says, now go wash your, eye, your eyes in this pool, this little um, like fountain called scent, the Siloam. Why does he do that? Why doesn't he just say, your, your sins have been washed away, receive your sight, go on your way. He sends him to a place called Sent, to this pool, to wash his eyes. And then he comes back saying, I see, I can see. But you have to think about how, how that is our story too. How Christ and the church asks us to do small little things. Small things to receive the great, immense blessings. He says, go wash your eyes. The man doesn't say, why, do I, why don't you just do it? I saw it, you know, I heard uh, you know, that you did this. Why, why do I have to go wash? Where is this place? How do I get there? He just goes. He, he has his, the clay on his eyes. He just walks and goes to the pool, washes his eyes, and he's like, oh, I can see. And he goes back and says, I can see, thank you. And then, and, you know, the story ensues from there, but he comes back being able to see. And then Christ kind of withdraws, and the man goes in the different paths that are later in the story. But you see that the man doesn't question. He does what he's told, and he receives his sight. All of us are looking for some type of miracle in our lives. Everybody is, at one point or another. Maybe it might be multiple miracles that you're looking for at the same time. But what is our effort to go forward, to go, to move in advance forward? You know, the, many times the Christ gives commandments to his disciples, not commandments like love one another. He says, go do this, go buy food, go do this, go do that. And they do it, and then they come back and things are changed. But for the ones that don't follow, the ones who are disobedient, there's nothing good that comes from that. There's nothing good that came from Judas. There's nothing good that came from the, uh, the rulers who were against Christ, where he gave them the opportunity to just make a little bit of an effort to come closer to him, and then he would come in this great way back. So what does it say about us? It says that in the church, the church asks you to do certain things, right? The church asks you to pray. The church asks you to fast. It asks you to live the life of the church sacramentally. It asks you for support in many ways, not only in, in uh, stewardship, but also support in the exterior where we see that we are being persecuted by so many false gods and false people that are attacking the church. God asks us to, to make a little bit of a step forward and to at least stand out and be different, as St. Paul says. Do we do that, or do we just expect the miracles? How can you expect the miracles without prayer? How can you expect the change in your life without fasting? How can you expect the grace of God to come in you sacramentally if you don't prepare for the sacraments, if you don't receive the sacraments? How can that happen? And the answer is, it won't. All God asks for is a little bit of direction. How hard is it really to stay back from a burger on a Wednesday and a Friday? Is it that bad? Is it that difficult? Are we just carnivorous and all our teeth are canines and we have no grinding molars and all we can do is chew through meat? Can we make that little bit of an effort? Saying our prayers, whether it's the morning or the evening, or both, or throughout the day. Can we do that? Can we just take a moment? And not to go into great length on uh, lofty prayers, as, as Christ says, but uh, the Pharisees do, but just to, to connect with God for a minute. You know, many times I, I've taken note of this for 
a long time in the church. And when we have meetings here, whether it's parish council meetings, whether it's philoptikos meetings, whether it's youth meetings, whether it's Greek school, whether it's whatever, there's many times people that come into the church, they go straight to their meeting or whatever it is, or they go to whatever the event is and fail to just walk in here and just do your cross and say, God, thank you for this. Or just to walk in and just look up at the dome for a minute, just to come in and say, oh, there he is. He's looking down, he's watching over, and then go to your meeting. Don't do yourself the disservice of walking into the church and not coming in here to just connect for a minute. Who knows how God will redirect you, but make that effort. Or going past an Orthodox church and, and making the sign of the cross. Many times people say, well, that's old school or whatever. Well, if that's old school, leave me in the old place. Because if you're driving on 290 by Central and you pass Loretto Hospital, why not remember that that church is the Church of the Virgin Mary there? And that there's, there's relics there. And that it's a blessed place and you're passing this blessed uh, area. People have, you know, on the side of the road, somebody dies or whatever the accident is, they put the cross up and everybody who goes past and they're like, oh, somebody died there. They remember that. We pass churches, we pass places of, of, of worship, and we fail to commemorate God or just to, for a second to pray. So the blind man is told, just do this little bit. All you got to do is just go wash your eyes and you're going to be fine. But he doesn't even say that. He just puts it on his eyes and says, go wash your eyes. And the man ends up being able to see. And then the Pharisees and the other people don't recognize him. And you might say, well, why don't they recognize him? Well, if you've ever seen a picture of someone who's maybe a teen, and then they age through their life, and then you see the picture of them as an older person, they don't look the same, right? I mean, unless you really have some good genetics, right? You're, uh, or genes, you're, you're, you t are going to look different. Things are going to be different. Your face is going to be probably heavier and saggier or whatever the case is. And uh, if you're a man, you're probably, you know, you know, challenged in the follicular area on top of your head or, or whatever the case is. You, you look different. There's a spread of, of look. But the one thing that is usually the commonality is if you look at what? The eyes, right? The eyes give it away. The eyes give many things away as far as the transition from a baby to a, a, a youth to a, an adult. The eyes, the shape of the eyes, the look of the eyes usually are the things that you see and you remember. In fact, you might even remember somebody's eyes over their, their physical features just by looking at their eyes. In fact, the eyes have been the, the focal point of, of the the person for since forever. In fact, when you look at somebody and you talk to somebody, where are you looking? You're not looking at their fingernails. You're looking at their, unless you really like the design or something on there, but you're looking at their eyes and you're focusing on their eyes. And as a person changes, if their eyes are closed and if the eyes are changed, in fact, there's actual um, research on that, that that shows different people that you might know that are public figures like whether it's a president or whether it's an actor or singer or whatever, and they change the eyes and they become unknown. You, you can't figure out who it is because the eyes are different. But you see that in the story, everybody's saying, is that the guy? Is that the one who now can see? Was he the one? Is that? No, it looks like him, but it's not really. Why can't they put it together? Because they never saw his eyes. They never were able to look into his eyes. And if they were recessed or sunken in, or if his eyes were white with no pupil or whatever, and if you've ever seen that before, or if they were grayed out like some, uh, some people who are blind, they wouldn't be able to tell who it is. And the only way that they know that is because he says, yes, I am this man. And they understand, they start hearing, and you start hearing voices, and you can kind of put two and two together that it's the same person. But the Pharisees are so angry about the fact that he was healed on a Sabbath that they're like, how did he do it? Why did he do it? When did he do it? We don't believe it. And that, that man's a sinner. And because the Pharisees knew that no one had been healed from blindness. So there's so many different aspects of this story today. Uh, but the one thing I want you to take away from it 
is how much of a step forward are you going to take for your own healing? How much are you going to do? How much are you going to say, you know what, I'm going to commit to doing this for God? And in that commitment, to expect, and we hear that in the, in the gospel too, that those who reach out in prayer and ask for prayerfully will receive. But how, do you, how, do you, how does that happen? You have to ask for the proper things and you have to do your part and you have to make that walk from being blind spiritually, physically, broken physically, spiritually, to moving forward to God for his glory. What's the effort? The effort starts very small, just one step at a time. One small step forward is getting you in the direction. But if you stop, where are you going to go? But if you're moving forward, even if you go backwards a little bit and continue to go forward, you're still going to become closer to God in, in all things. So take this command that Christ gave the blind man, and he says, go and wash wash your eyes. And I know that from hearing uh, stories of youth to adults, some of the stuff that we put in our eyes, as far, I'm not talking like uh, solution or, uh, you know, visine, but some of the stuff that we visualize in others and some of the stuff that people are looking at on screens and on uh, billboards and in person, go wash and see who God is, and make that effort to, to cleanse yourself through prayer, through fasting, through the sacraments of the church, through the life of the church. And when you come to church, no matter what it is for, come inside, look at God, and appreciate all the gifts and the miracles that he has given to you, and make that step forward day after day after day. And it doesn't have to be huge steps, but one small step at a time forward closer to God and I know that he will take the, the requests that you have, the needs, the sickness, whatever it is, and he will make that something different for you so that you can continually give him thanks and appreciation for the healing and for the miracles in your life. Amen.